Welcome to the teaching ministry of Rev. Daryl Baker, pastor of Christian Faith Fellowship. Pastor Baker is fulfilling the call of God on his life to preach the Word of God without compromise. Raising up disciples who through faith in God will have a powerful impact on our world. May you be blessed through the message that Pastor Baker has to share with you today. May God's very best be yours. Second Timothy chapter 2. Everybody got notes tonight? Anybody not have? <clears throat> Make sure everybody's got them. Everybody got notes? Praise God. Kim's been so good about helping everybody out, making sure everybody gets notes. Thank you, Miss Kim. Second Tim, Timothy chapter 2. Tonight, we're going to talk about a divine separation. There's all kinds of places in the Bible that in referencing the last days, it talks about a divine separation. Why divine separation, Pastor? Man's not doing it. God's doing it. God decrees through these verses we're going to look at tonight that he begins in the last days to cause a separation to happen. Some of it already taking place. Other parts of this divine separation will happen once the rapture occurs. I'll guarantee you, you and I simply want to do what we know Scripture teaches. Be ready. Be ready. Be in the right part of the right company as the separation takes place. Amen? Point number one on your notes tonight. Notice this. Learn now. Learn right now that you must beware of the condition of the last days. I want to say that again. Learn now that you must be aware of the conditions of the last days. And therefore what? Fortify yourself spiritually. Underline that. Spiritually. Fortify yourself spiritually against them. You, you cannot fortify yourself physically against the things that the Bible tells us to obviously protect ourselves against. You fortify yourself spiritually. You become spiritually strong, spiritually aware, and you'll be prepared. I, I think tonight about in this teaching about the prophecy we've talked about from Brother Wigglesworth many times. In the last days, there needs to be special preparation for the return of the Lord. I wanted to bring that prophecy tonight, but we got a lot to cover, so I don't want to go through all of that. But he stated in there clearly. Now, this was a prophetic word from Smith Wigglesworth, you know, years and years ago before he went to heaven. He even said, obviously, he said, uh, he stated in that word that he gave, he said, and half of all the body of Christ will not be prepared. Not half the world, half the body of Christ. So you'll see this as we go through this tonight in this context of talking about this divine separation. Are you in 2 Timothy chapter 2 yet? Verse 1. We're going to read these first four verses here of 2 Timothy chapter 2. You therefore, my son, talking to Timothy, of course, and he is a believer, and yes, as a young pastor, you, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. Now, how... Uh, how can we be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus? Anybody know? Anybody help me preach tonight? How can I be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus? By faith. By faith? Modern day grace teachers would certainly not tell you what the Bible says about it. But anybody, can anybody, does, does a reference to a scripture come to mind about being strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus? Well, let me help you. The book of James says, God gives more grace. Strong in the grace means I got more than just what I got when I was saved. And he says that you can receive more grace. Therefore, therefore, humble yourselves. Humble yourselves unto God. You and I, to be humble, simply do what? We don't see ourselves higher than what God says we are, but we don't see ourselves lower than what God says we are. Amen? And then he goes on there in James 4 and says, submit to God. Resist the devil, and he will do what? Flee from you. So this is being strong in the grace. The modern-day grace teachers say, oh, yeah, man, we need to teach you more about grace and get off all these, quote-unquote, legalistic things everybody's telling you to do, da 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 I'm going to tell you, being strong in the grace of Christ is being humble and submitting yourself to God. Amen? And if you do, guess what you get? More grace. More grace. Verse 2, watch. And the things that you've heard from me, Paul said, the things you've heard from me among many witnesses, many witnesses. Commit these. Commit these to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. So what that's telling a quote-unquote young pastor 
And what that's telling me as your pastor is, quit trying to come up with stuff that's new. I quit a long time ago. As a young pastor, you kind of feel like I got to come up with something nobody's ever heard, you know. And that leads you obviously into dangerous territory. No, you take what you've learned from two things, spiritual fathers that you've then applied to your life and seen work and you teach it to your church family. I tell people all the time who teach in this pulpit, don't teach theory. Don't try to teach something you learned from somebody else but hadn't applied to your life. Teach it after you've lived it. Learn it, apply it, teach it. And that's, now you'll pass on to others, obviously, what's been given to you. Verse 3, underline this. You, therefore, all of us as a church, all the body of Christ, you, therefore, must circle that word. Now, this is not an option for a last day's believer if you want to live victorious. You must endure hardship. Well, I don't want to. You're going to. Or if you don't, you'll be overtaken by them. Hardship, hard times, hard challenges. We're in a day of what the Bible calls perilous times. I will assure you, we're in for some hard times financially, even worse, in our country. That does not mean it has to take advantage of you. It does not mean you can, that you're going to have to do without. But you've got to realize not everything in this world is going to go the way we want it to. Yes, we should pray. Yes, we should be doing our part. But the Bible prophesied a lot of the stuff you're seeing, and you're not going to change it by prayer. Because the Bible told us that a lot of these things would happen. But again, notice, you must say, I must. Watch this. You must endure what? Hardship as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. So how do we endure hardship? Pastor is a good soldier of Jesus Christ. Can I help you? Be his disciple. Be his disciple. Because if you're his disciple, you're going to walk just like him. Come on, Luke chapter 6, a disciple is not above his teacher, but he who is completely trained will be just like his teacher. If you're walking like Jesus, you're not going to have any problem. To to endure doesn't mean put up with. To endure means it doesn't get you down. It doesn't defeat you. It doesn't beat you. You don't lose your faith. Come on, you don't don't cower down and go into a pity party and woe is me. No, endure means you rise up and put it under your feet. You say who you are. You walk in the light of who you are. Endure is not like put up with. Endure is, you know what? Just like a good, a good soldier goes into battle, how many know he's going to face hardship? But if he's a good soldier, how many know he's going to overcome? He's going to be victorious. He's not going to get defeated. I think of something Pastor used to tell, you know, he would get on a chopper as a Marine sniper leading troops into battle, many different battles, off of a, off of a Navy carrier. And he would get those Marines on that chopper. And as they're going on the way into where they're going to fight that day, he said, you got two options. Somebody's going to die today. It's going to be you or your enemy. You decide. You decide. Because I'm telling you, boys, that's the reality of what we're facing. They want to die for their country. Do you want to die for yours? Or do you want to live for it? I tell you, live for it. Yeah, you're willing to lay your life down, but don't go in thinking, I want to die for it. No, go in there to want to live for it. And make your enemy die for his country. That's what our pastor would tell his troops. Can I tell you what Jesus would say to us? Don't die for me. Live for me. Make your enemy die. Make him suffer. Talking about, the, talking about demons and stuff. They've already been defeated. But in other words, don't let, them, don't let them gain ascendancy over you. Put them in their place. Don't, don't cower down because what's going on and start, woe is me and how am I going to do this and what am I going to do about that? You're not enduring hardship as a good soldier. Do, now, see, obviously to be a good soldier, you've got to be trained. That's why you need to make church a priority because you've got to keep training. Amen. Verse 4, no one, no one engaged in warfare. Kathy said it Sunday, like it or not, you're in a battle. You may not like it, but you're in a battle. You're in, you're in a war zone, ladies and gentlemen. The earth is a war zone. How do we know? We have an enemy here. You know, if there was no enemy here, there would be no war zone. But there is. So guess what? You and I should do what? Recognize that no one engaged in warfare. Say, I am. Does what? Entangles himself with the affairs of this life. Underline it. He does not entangle himself with the affairs of this life. He doesn't think like the way the world thinks. He doesn't get caught up with all those who in in the natural, let's just say the natural, a battle's going on, a war's going on in another country. We send troops. We're not there battling. We're, We're caught up with the affairs of life. They're not. They're not thinking about what we're thinking about. 
You listening to me? They're not thinking about what we're thinking about. They're thinking about having to run their, their uh, uh, you know, their, uh, um, what do you call it? Their, help me out, guys. Their, their, their combat, you know, orders <laughs> to go every day to do with their missions. That was, they have to run their missions every day. They're thinking about their mission for that day. They're thinking about what they got to do. Well, folks, what he just told you as a believer, you're in a war zone. Stop thinking like the world, getting caught up with all the affairs of life. What should you be doing? What's my mission today? I got to run a mission today. I got to do what God told me to do today. Live the way God told me to live. So no one engaged in warfare entangles himself with the affairs of this life. Why? That he may please him who enlisted him as a soldier. How many want to please the one that enlisted you as a soldier? His name is Jesus, by the way. How do I please him? Turn over to chapter 3. How do I please him? I'll tell you how you please him. You please him by walking in the victory he gave you. You please him by using the God-given authority that he gave you. You please him by taking the dominion he told you to take. You're not pleasing God by not reaching after, uh, excuse me, reaching out and going after lost souls. You're not pleasing the one that enlisted you by not being a witness. You're not pleasing the one that enlisted you by not being an actual light to the world. Of what the goodness of our God is all about and talking to people about that. Amen. And reaching out to try to help people. You're not, in, you're not pleasing because you're not in the battle. That's right. You're not in the battle. Every time I come across somebody that's a sinner, I know I'm not doing warfare with that sinner. Right. I'm doing warfare with the enemy who doesn't want them to know what I know. Right. But I'm going to tell them what I know my God wants them to know. Right. Can I get a better amen? amen. Chapter 3 verse 1. But know this. So you better know it. Know this, that in the last days, perilous times will come. You can't avoid them. How I many know you're there already? Men will be come. These are not to be you here. This next context of these verses is not to describe you here. But it says men will become lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, un. Holy, none of these are supposed to be us. Unloving, unforgiving, slanderers, without self control, brutal, despisers of good, traitors, headstrong, haughty, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. If there's things more important to you to go do, with your time outside of this church, then be in the house of God when you could be here instead. I'm not talking about if you got to be at work. I'm not talking about if you could go do other things, but, be, but, uh, do, but you could be here and you're going doing those other things. You're falling into a position of a lover of pleasure. You're in a war zone. When you come back and rule and reign for a thousand years, you won't be battling demons. Well, I just want to see all these things and enjoy all these things. What do you got a thousand years here to do? Guess what you're not going to do during the thousand years? You're not going to be winning souls that I know of. I mean, Dr. Sutton, Sutton, Sutton said we might, but the truth is, you're going to get to enjoy a thousand years. If you lived a good long life right now, you're going to get a hundred. You're going to come back for a thousand. Come on. Don't get caught up with the affairs of this life. Recognize what your purpose is right now. I'm going to say it again. Recognize what your purpose is right now. Why does God have you on this planet in the last days right now? Write it down. What is my purpose here right now? What is it? Why am I here? Why am I here? To earn a living? Why am I here? To try to, try to raise more money? To have more stuff? See, why am I here? I'm here to change hearts. I'm here to win souls. I'm here to change people over into the gospel. I'm here to get the captives set free. I'm, I don't, if you're still breathing, I don't care who you are on the planet and you're a believer, you're here to do the same thing all the rest of the body of Christ is to do. That's why you're here. You may not be fulfilling your function, but that's why you're here. And a soldier knows what they are called to do. Can I get an Amen. And I'm telling you, it'll make your life more powerful and stronger. Amen? So notice this. He again said in verse 4 that many of them would be lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. 5, having a form of godliness. So this isn't talking about sinners. This is talking about believers. 
having a form of godliness, but they're denying its power. And from such people do what? Turn away. For of this sort are those who creep into households, little creeps, and they make captives of gullible women. I just say, pastor always says it when he reads that. I hear my pastor saying, them little creeps, man, taking advantage of people. They make captives of gullible women, loaded down with sins, and led away by various lusts, always learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. Because you come to, how do you come to the knowledge of the truth? Don't answer that. How do you come to the knowledge? I always tell you, go, well, don't you have an answer? Because it was a question. Don't answer that. How do you come to the knowledge of the truth? I'll tell you you come to the knowledge of the truth. You come to the knowledge of the truth by renewing of the mind and living out what your mind is being renewed to. And now you know the truth by experience and it sets you free. See, when Jesus said in John 8, 31, if you abide in my word, you're my disciples indeed. 32, you'll know the truth and the truth will set you free. Knowing the truth does not appear in your head. Right. Knowing the truth is by experience. It's by living it out. Now I know it works. Yes. See, now, I, and the minute you start living it out, guess what it does? It frees you. It begins to go to work to free you. So coming to the knowledge of the truth means I'm living it by experience. So question, if, if these people are denying the power thereof, and they are always learning, but never... Notice that. They're learning. Listen to that verse. Always learning, never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. Why? I just told you. Why are they not able to come to the knowledge of the truth? They're not doers of the word. They're not doers of the word. Because to know the truth is by experience. Putting it into application. Practicing it in your life. And then seeing it work. And guess what? When the word goes to work, guess what comes? Liberty. Guess what comes? Liberty. The truth will set you free. But it doesn't happen by just knowledge in your head. So this refers to a lot of Christians who have filled their heads with a lot of knowledge. But they aren't living it anymore. Even if they were. But they aren't living it anymore. And realize because of that, guess what? They're starting to fall fall under these categories. My goodness, there are so many slandering Christians right now. I wouldn't call them slandering Christians, believers. Because a Christian means I'm doing what Jesus did. Jesus didn't slander. Go to Matthew 7. So this is the warning that we're given again about the day we're living in. So let's look at what Scripture then teaches about this divine separation in this day. Let's go to some of the words of Jesus. What do you think? Matthew 7, don't ever let some preacher, fancy pants preacher, talk you out of living by what Jesus taught. Well, that don't apply to us. He was still under the old covenant. That is, so, that is so goofed up. I can't even tell you the heresy that's in that statement. Jesus is your model. I am his disciple. How am I going to be his disciple if I don't take what he taught me and apply it to my life? That's just crazy. I mean, but that's where we are today. But understand, Jesus talked about multiple times in Scripture about this divine separation. Number two on your notes, Jesus himself is the one who warned us of the separation that would take place in the end times. Now, I'll tell you who will not like this teaching tonight. Let me tell you who won't like this teaching. People that get mad at this teaching online or otherwise, I'm going to tell you who don't, don't want to hear this teaching. Goats. Foolish virgins. They're, they're not going to like this message tonight. If this rattles your cage, you might be waking up and say, you know what, I might be dealing with some goat issues here. I've taught you, how does a sheep sound? Bah. How does a goat sound? Nah. Nah. But that's what the Bible says. Nah. You don't want to receive it. And I'm going to tell you right now, you don't want to be a goat, you want to be a sheep. Matthew 7, 13, you with me? Jesus said, enter by the narrow gate. I'm going to tell you what, there's verses in the Bible I don't like. I didn't say I don't like the fact they're there, but I just don't like the connotation of what they say, but it's a reality. Can't change it. Jesus said, this is red letters. Jesus said, narrow is that gate. Enter into the, enter in by the narrow gate. For wide is the gate and broad is the way that leads to what? Now, I don't like this, but notice what it says. And there are many There are many who go in by it. Many. 14. Because narrow is the gate and difficult. That means confined. It's like a very small 
you know, aspect of a way to get in somewhere. Difficult or narrow is the way, confined is the way, which leads to what? Life. That's the way. Life as God has it. And there are few that find it. Listen, to, there are few. There are few. Ladies and gentlemen, I can't speak for you, but kind of like the Marines say, I'm going to be one of the few. Amen. How about you? Yes. I said, how about you? Yes. We got to make sure we're not going in by the broad gate. That's right. The broad gate's the easy way. The narrow gate's the confined way. Not so easy. Broad gate, wide, easy. It's, I want everything easy. What do we just read? You better learn to endure hardship as a good soldier. You listening? But if you always want the easy way out, you're going by the broad gate. The narrow gate is the confined way that God says leads to the kind of life I have for you. And you can't do that being a sloppy agape, just do whatever I want believer. Not if you want to walk in Zoe life. Are you still with me tonight? All right, 2A, the wide gate eventually will lead to what? Hell and damnation. If those people go, keep going that direction. And again, I don't like it much more than I think any believer would. But what did Jesus say? Many go by that, that way. Many will. What's that tell me? There are going to be a lot of people in hell, sadly. There going to be a lot of people in hell. The moment a person wakes up in hell, they're going to wish they'd have listened to you. You understand that? The very moment that a person wakes up in hell, they're going to wish they'd have listened. They're going to wish they'd have paid attention to what the believers were saying to them. Uh, 2B, many enter by this wide gate. 2C, the narrow and straight gate leads to what? Eternal life with Christ. 2D, only what? He said it, not me. Only few ever find it. That's why I said I've always had a hard time where people talk about this mass harvest of souls. Now, Brother Sutton pointed out some scriptures to me in Zechariah that reveals an end time revival. Even, even Smith Wigglesworth prophesied about that coming. I'm not saying we don't get people born again. But he said, Jesus said, that narrow gate, few find it. Say, I'm one of the few. I'd I'd be saying with a little more conviction in my heart, make me feel good as your pastor. I'm one of the few. I hope you're not just saying it to say it. Hope you mean it. I believe you do. I said, I believe you do. 2E, this of course speaks of a separation, does it not? Yeah, speaks of a separation between those who live the lifestyle by faith of a Christian and those who live another. 2F, it is, it is very evident that some go to heaven and some go to hell according to, what, uh, according to which gate, notice this, they enter. Who decides this? The they, the individual. We choose as to what gate we're going to go in. How many are going to choose the right one? Yes. 721, let's learn a little more. On down the chapter, verse 21. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord. This is an astounding set of verses here. Three astounding verses here from Jesus' lips. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven. Oh, you're my Lord. You're my Lord. But not everybody who says that will enter the kingdom of heaven. How many think Jesus lied about it? No. But he who does the will of my Father in heaven. Underline that, please. He who does the will of my Father in heaven. Well, we're earning our way to heaven. No, you're not. No, you're not. To do the will of the Father in heaven is to receive Christ Jesus as your Lord, become a disciple of Jesus, and walk with him all the days of your life. Now you're doing the will of God. Even one time, Jesus is in a setting, people crowding around the home. Man, they can't even get near him. There's so many people. And all of a sudden, somebody says, Do you not know that your your mother, your brothers, your sisters... They're out here wanting to see you. He said, who are my mother, brothers, and sisters? He said, I'll tell you who. Whoever does the will of my father, they are my mother. They are my brothers. They are my sisters. He wasn't being disrespectful. He was saying it's not about just being born into a family. It's not about just being born into a family. It's about being born into a family to do the will of God. To live out what God teaches. Can I get a better amen? This blows the sloppy agape grace messages out of the water. You can't just get born again and do whatever you want and think I'm going to be good when the rapture takes place. It's not what the Bible teaches. I'm not trying to scare anybody. If you're walking with God, you don't have no fear. Could I get a better amen? 22. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name? Cast out demons in your name? Notice this. Do, done what? Cast out demons in your name. Done many wonders in your name. Then I will declare. Jesus will say. 
I will declare to them, I never knew you. He didn't say they didn't know him. He said, I never knew you. I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice what? <clears throat> Underline the last part of the verse, you who practice lawlessness. How, do, how does Jesus get to know us? We just talked, this, this was, I didn't think about it until just now, the prophetic word God gave us. How does Jesus get to know us? You got to draw near to him because he won't draw near to you until you draw near to him. James wasn't talking to sinners. James 4 was talking to believers. Draw near to God, he'll draw near to you. Right? Well, if he draws near to us, guess what? He gets to know us. Well, he already knows everything about us. He's not talking about the relationship of understanding spiritually. He's talking about getting to know you by fellowship and relationship. Any amens on this? Number three, you can't always tell if someone is right with God just because they look like they are. A form of godliness? Come on, 2 Timothy 3, they have a form of godliness, but they deny the power. They deny the actual working of the Holy Spirit to change them, to transform them. 3A, notice they said what? Lord, Lord. 3B, these people did what? They prophesied in Jesus' name. Do you know Jesus did not say, no, you didn't? Did he? Jesus didn't say, when they said, we prophesied in your name. Jesus didn't say, no, you didn't. He just said, I never knew you. You listening? Watch this. See, they even cast out demons in Jesus' name. They said so. They did mighty works in Jesus' name. Did they not say so? Did Jesus deny any of that? Notice E, 3E. They certainly knew how to use Jesus' name and did it frequently, don't you think? Absolutely. But notice F. Jesus said that he what? We'll tell you why. Look at G. He also told them to depart from him. Boy, I do not want to hear those words. I'm not going to hear those words. I'm not afraid because I know I'm not going to because I'm not going to do what this verse said. This last part of the last verse there in 23. He told them to depart because they were those who what? I bolded this on purpose. Practice lawlessness. Coming back to that, H, remember then, listen, remember then that you cannot tell if ministers or believers are right with God just because they do mighty works. Prophesy accurately, cast out demons, or use the name of Jesus. That don't mean they're right with God. They said they did all those things, right? Now back up to G. Watch this. But notice what they were doing. They practiced lawlessness. All right? Two-fold application. If you want to put a little separate note there, let me tell you what that means. One, the ultimate law of all of the universe is God's Word. The world is upheld by the Word of God's power. That's a law. That's a law. When you start disregarding God's Word and you do so on purpose, you're practicing lawlessness. Now, I don't mean to disregard God's Word Uh, By not knowing it, I'm talking about knowingly. Practiced. Practice, practice, practice. You could tell somebody, this is what the Bible says. Well, I know it says that, but, and they want to do something different. They're practicing lawlessness. They know what the Bible says. They're choosing not to do it. If you know what the Bible says, we're not talking about something you got a stronghold with. We're talking about basic Christian practices. Basic Christian principles. Does the Bible tell us to not forsake assembling together? Why do so many believers do it when they know the Bible says it? They're practicing lawlessness. They have a love for the world more than they have a love for God. Loving pleasure. That's why we read those verses. Lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. And they convince themselves because they're lovers of pleasure, I don't have to go to church. Nobody said you had to. God said you need to. If you're doing it because you feel you have to, you won't get nothing out of it. If you do it because you're like Jesus and you love God, and because you love God, you love God's house, and just like Jesus had a zeal for God's house, you have a zeal for God's house, and you have a zeal for God's people. And you can't wait to get around your church family. Can't wait to be around one another. Well, I don't like being around these people. Bless God, guess what? Maybe they don't like being around you. (laughs) But you ought to. You ought to love being around your church family. We're a family. I said, we're a family. I I get excited to get to see you when you show up. 
It's like you, if you went to go, you know, to a, a big family kind of get-together thing, although sometimes those aren't so good, you know. But if, <laughs> it was a good thing, you know. And there's people aren't there. You miss them. Right. You want to see them. That's a pastor. Why it bugs me people don't come is because I miss you. I don't get to see you. I don't get to see you get helped. So understand this. He clearly said in verse G, they would what? Practice lawlessness. So number one, it's, an, it's a knowing disregard for God's word. It's a knowing disregard for, I know what God's word says, I choose to do something else. That is practicing lawlessness. Number two, the other key of practicing lawlessness, clearly the Bible tells us, that anything that we understand and know that is a violation of God's word for our life is a sinful act, missing the mark. Go read all those things Timothy talked about in chapter 3, much of which is sinful. All of it's sinful, not much, all of it. Slander, sinful. Betrayal, sinful. All these things are sin. And a person who does walk in sin knowingly and doesn't care, too, they're practicing lawlessness. They walk in sin knowingly and they don't care. They're practicing lawlessness. Disregard for what God's word says and violating what scripture teaches me and you that we should not be obviously doing as a believer that is sin. Now how many of you have ever had in your life something you knew was sinful and it was a stronghold and you didn't like it and you were trying to get free from it? I'm going to tell you something Pastor Barclay used to say. I love it. God knows, still said, God knows if that thing has you or you have it. If it has you, you're trying to get free. You keep trying to shake it off. But if you have it, you can let go and walk away anytime you want. The person that has something they know they shouldn't have a hold of. And they keep holding on to it. And they could let go anytime, they're practicing lawlessness. And I promise you what, if they don't get repentant and correct it and fix it, or the person that has a disregard for God's word doesn't repent and fix it, guess where they're headed? They're headed to hear the words of Jesus. Depart from me. He said it, not me. Depart from me. I never knew you. You who practice lawlessness. Got to move on. All right, Matthew 13. He's still here. I don't believe I'm speaking to anybody in this church that this would apply to. I'm speaking to people in this church to say, don't let it become you. Can I get a better amen than that? I don't believe I'm speaking to anybody in my church personally that this is applying to. But don't let it become you. Because if it does, man, I'll tell you what, it's a subtle way that Satan works at you to try to get you further and further and further away from God. Do you know Satan is so arrogant He's so stinking arrogant. He still thinks he's going to win you. He still thinks he's going to take you to hell with him. He knows where he's going, folks. I love that word that, you know, Brandy shared with us from uh, Nancy Dufresne. You know, turn the mirror on him. You know, he keeps accusing you of all this stuff you did wrong. Okay, maybe I did, but I've repented. Jesus is my Savior. Turn the mirror on him, but you know what? You can't repent. You can't get forgiven. You listening? It's done for you, buddy. It's done for you. Matthew 13, 24. You still with me? Another parable Jesus set forth to them, saying, The kingdom of heaven is also like a man who went and sowed seed in his field. This is God. But while men slept, his enemy came. God's enemy came. And he sowed tares among the wheat. And he went his way. So there is in this, quote-unquote, this field of both the church and in the context of the body of Christ and in the earth of believers. There are those who are wheat whom God sowed, and there are those who are tares whom the enemy has sown. 26, but when the grain had had, uh, sprouted and produced a crop, then the tares also appeared right along with them. So the servants of the owner came and they said, Sir, did you not sow good seed in your field? How then does it have tares? He said to them, an enemy has done this. The servant said to him, do you want us to then go and gather them up? This is the pastors. See, the pastors are saying, do you not realize that there's tares in these fields as well? Should we go ahead and get rid of the tares? Should we gather them up? 29. But he said, this is God speaking, the Lord. He said, no, no. Lest while you gather up the tares, you also uproot the, the wheat with them. 30. Let both grow together until the harvest. Till when? And at the time of harvest, 
I will say to the reapers, first gather together the tares, bind them in bundles and burn them, but gather the wheat into my barn. Sounds like a divine separation. I, you know, this is something a lot of people don't know. What's a tear? What's a tear? It's not a weed. A tear looks just exactly like wheat. When you look at it side by side, they look identical. Can't tell the difference. Absolutely identical. They grow up the same size, same type of stock, same type of outer appearance. What's the difference? Inside the tear, the seeds are black and they're poisonous to man. But you don't know it till you harvest them. They look identical. They look identical. What have we read? You got people who have a godlike appearance. But their heart may not be right. Are you listening? Four. Jesus himself is the one who warned us about the separation of what? Wheat and tares. We're looking tonight at what? Divine separation. I didn't say you're on the wrong side of that. I'm believing you're not. It's to make sure we protect ourselves and don't get there. 4A, notice this. They were all planted about what? Same time. They were all what? They were all together in the same field. 4C, you could not tell them apart until harvest time because you can't see the seed on the inside. So they look identical. C1, we all consider the harvest time in the Bible as the last days. 4D, the shepherds were warned not to pluck up the tares, remember? The servants here are the shepherds. Don't pluck up the tares lest the wheat be uprooted also. This is some great divine insight here. Easy to understand. D1. This means the shepherds must know. We do, by the way. The shepherds must know who the tares are. Otherwise, we would not uh, have, uh, we would have no, excuse me, we would have no warning about plucking them up. A believer may not know, but shepherds do. Why would they have come and said, hey, you want us to remove the tares? They obviously knew who they were. Right? D2, wheat being plucked. Don't worry, I'm not looking around anybody. <laughs> I'm not, like I said, I don't think this applies to us right now. D2, watch. Wheat being plucked out with them is in reference to the relatives and the friends of the tares. If you pull the tares out, what's going to go with them? He said, you're going to pluck up some other wheat with it. Mean what? Friends and relatives. D3, the first thing tares will do when they leave a ministry is try to persuade their family and friends to do the same. Guess what I don't do? I don't pluck up tares. But you know what I learned to do from my pastor? You got to pray over your church to believe God, to God, to God for God to bring the right people in. But you also got to believe God sometimes to move people out. You don't move them out. That's up to God. He's the one that does it, not you. You're still here. E, 4E, remember that Jesus, notice this, excuse me, yeah, remember that Jesus taught us that wheat goes into the threshing floor, right, to have the chaff blown away, thank you Jesus, but the tares are bundled and burned. Tell your neighbor, I'm not going to be a tear. Matthew 25. What's a tear? Looks identical, similar, similar type of species of plant, identical to wheat, but inside it, it has black seeds, and those seeds are poisonous to man. We've got to guard our, hearts, our guard, guard our lives against tares. Matthew 25. Come on, you know these. Verses 25, 31. When the Son of Man comes in His glory and all the holy angels with Him, then He will sit on the throne of His glory, all the nations, all ethnic groups. They will be gathered before Him. He will separate them one from another. Sounds like another divine separation. He'll separate them one from another as a shepherd divides his sheep from the goats. And he will set the sheep on his right hand, but the goats on the left. Then the king will say to those on his right hand, Come, you blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, you gave me what? Help me out, church. Come on. I was hungry, you gave me what? Jesus said, you gave me food. I was thirsty, you gave me drink. I was a stranger, you did what? You took me in. 36, I was naked, you clothed me. I was sick, you visited me. I was in prison, you came to me. Then the righteous will answer, saying to him, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you or thirsty and give you drink? When did we see you a stranger take you in or naked and clothe you? 39. Or when did we uh, see you sick and in prison and come to you? 40. This is powerful. The king will answer, Jesus, and say to them, Assuredly, I say to you, and as much as you did it to one of the least of these, my brethren, you did it to me. Who does those things? The sheep do. 
Who does not do those things? Goats. Goats do not. Number five, Jesus himself is the one who taught us of the separation of what? Sheep and goats. 5A, the angels help do the separation here. 5B, sheep go where? Heaven, goats go to? C, sheep and goats are separated by whether they, notice this, whether or not they were doers of the word. Who are the sheep? Doers of the word. Who are the goats? The ones who did not do what the word told them they should be doing. Are we, are we hearing from Jesus tonight? Because yes. Yes. see, oh, you'll get people, man, I'm ta- I'm, I'm, a lot of people probably done unplugged me, you know, 20, 30 minutes ago in this message. But I'll tell you who would disconnect from this message. A goat. A tear. Because Jesus, this is Jesus talking. This ain't your pastor. I'm just reading what Jesus said. Notice this. Very clear. 5C. Sheep and goats are separated by whether or not they're doers of the word. C1. Thirsty, you did what? You gave me drink. Hungry, you gave me food. Naked, you clothed me. Captive, you helped set me free. Five, if you do it to the least of these, my brethren, what are you doing? It? You're doing it unto the Lord. Right. Six, the goats did, notice, the goats did none of these, though they were aware of these conditions. They were not, they were not uh, unknowledgeable about those things. They just chose what? Not to do them. Not important. D, the law in heaven. This is powerful. Get this, because the angels are going to come. And cause this separation. The law in heaven is whatever a man believes, that is what he does. Do you get that? Whatever a man believes, that's what he does. You're still here. If I truly believe the gospel, the Bible, I'm a, I'm a sheep, I'm a child of God, guess what? Then that's what you're going to live like. Notice this. There are no exceptions. Because lying, procrastination, etc., guess what? It, it don't exist in heaven. Therefore, the angels worked separating according to what a man was doing. This is what the angels thought he believed. Think about that. Thank you, Dr. Mark T. Barclay. How are the angels going to go separate? Based on what they see, what they had done. Because what they saw them do obviously taught them what they actually believed. If I really believe in Jesus and in the gospel, I'm going to be busy about his work. I'm going to do whatever I can. To help do his work. That's why I'm here. Amen. Why are you here? Same reason. That's why we're here. Come on. Elbow your neighbor. Say, that's why we're here, man. Why we're here. E, on that day there. Now, I, you know, the Holy Spirit just nudged me. He said, you have people concerned about family members. Folks, I'm sorry, but you can't change this for anybody. You can't change it. Pray for them. Pray their eyes would be open. Don't sit back and just do nothing. Start praying. God, open their eyes up. Help them understand. They need to get serious about their walk with you. Can I get a better amen? amen. Now, wait a minute. What well, if they don't make the rapture? That don't mean they're going to hell. That's right. That's right. Thank God for three and a half years of tribulation. That's, I, I say thank God. For, I don't mean the tribulation, but the preaching of the gospel. Amen. It's going to be a massive wake-up call for a whole lot of folks. Amen. May it not be for me and you. E, on that day there will be a, notice this, there will not be enough time to ask whether or not you are of Christ. When that time comes that the angels are sent to separate, there ain't going to be time. It's already done. F, remember Jesus warned us uh, uh, that his coming should not catch us like what? A thief in the night. G, your faith and lifestyle, ladies and gentlemen, are what determine your outcome. He just said it. I said, he just said it. Never think that because you're, you believe something, it is the same as doing it. I say that all the time. Don't ever think because you believe something, you're doing it. Well, I believe that. Why don't you do it? <laughs> Why don't you do it? Well, I believe what the Bible says about marriage. Why don't you do it? Well, I believe what the Bible says about giving. Why don't you do it? Well, I believe what the Bible says about forgiveness. Then why don't you forgive? Well, I believe what the Bible says about serving the Lord. Then why don't you serve? I'm not saying you're not. I'm just, you know, just, I'm preaching. Don't just say you believe it. Because, you know, what are the angels going to determine what you believe? What are you doing? Because what you're doing shows what you really believe. Matthew 25, verse 1, back up. So here's the parable of the virgins. What are we talking about tonight? Church, help me out. 
Divine separation. This is all about divine separation, what God says he's going to do in separating people. 25.1, the kingdom of heaven shall be likened to ten virgins. What will be the kingdom? Be likened to ten virgins. You can't even think about becoming a part of the kingdom without being pure and holy in the eyes of God. It'll be likened to ten virgins who took their lamps. They all went out to meet the bridegroom. Lamp represents salvation. Study it through the Bible. The, the lamp, you go back to Revelation, he talks about the lamp. He refers to the church. Who's the church? That's me and you, Ecclesia. We're the called out ones. Thank God my lamp's lit. How about you? So notice this. The, the, the ten virgins who took their lamps, they went out to meet who? The bridegroom. Now notice this. Five, now by the way, the virgins are not the bride. They're friends of the bridegroom. The bride is the new Jerusalem. The Bible's really clear about this, black and white. Anybody teaches you we're the bride of Christ? No, we're not. No, we're the friends of the bridegroom. We get to go celebrate with the bridegroom. Revelation, we taught you this in the Revelation study. Black and white, it tells you. It's the new Jerusalem. Hallelujah. Verse 2. Five of them, what? Virgins. Five of them were what? Wise. Five of them were what? Which one you think you want to be? I think so. How about you? Three, those who were foolish took their lamps, but did what? Underline it. They took no oil with them. Their lamps are lit, no extra oil. Polk your neighbor said, don't be a foolish virgin. Tell them, keep extra oil with you. Why were they foolish? They had their lamps lit, no extra oil. Verse 5, but, when the, but while the bridegroom was delayed, they all slumbered and slept. And at midnight a cry was heard, Behold, the bridegroom is coming. Go out to meet him. Then all those virgins arose and did what? Trimmed their lamps. What happens if you're running low on oil? Your lamp's going to start flickering. As our pastor says, you don't want to be no flickering wick at that time. I get better, amen. Notice 8, and the foolish said to the wise, You need to give us some of your oil because our lamps are going out. But the wise answered, saying, no, no, lest there should, what? Should not be enough for us and you. Watch what they were concerned about. But go rather to those who sell and buy for yourselves. What? No, because there would not be enough for us and you. What would that mean? He's coming, he's coming back. Nobody would be here for him. What's their concern? We're going to have somebody ready for him when he comes. Verse 10. And while they went to buy, the who? The foolish. The, bride gain, the bridegroom came. And those who were ready, say those who were ready. Underline it. Those who were ready went in with him to the wedding. The door was shut. Sounds kind of like Noah's day, don't it? Afterward, the other virgins came also saying, Lord, Lord. What they say? Lord, Lord. Open to us. These are virgins. These are born again believers. But he answered and said, as surely I say to you, I what again? Don't know you. Watch therefore, because you know neither the day nor the hour in which the Son of Man is coming. Watch this, number six on your notes. Come on, we got to scoot along. Jesus warns us of the 50% factor. 6a, the teachings of the ten virgins. All ten virgins unspotted from the world. Two, they all had lamps. Three, they all had oil in their lamps. Four, all lamps were burning until the shout came about the bridegroom coming. You know what you're seeing right now? You're starting to see some lamps flicker. Because he's coming. The five lamps flickered, but they had no what? Extra oil. So these other six, these other five virgins had extra oil, and their lamps did what? Burned on. The five flickering, uh, the seven, the five flickering virgins wanted to borrow or beg oil from others. Let me help you. You ought to circle that number seven or underline it, because what does that mean? Foolish virgins are trying all the time to get wise virgins out of church, away from God, away from their Bible. Trying to take advantage of your oil. Trying to take advantage of your extra oil. Eight. The wise virgins said what? No. What'd they say? No. Excuse me? No. no. You kidding me? Nobody will be here for Jesus. Ready. Nine. The foolish virgins were used to being, listen, listen, this is powerful. What a powerful statement here by, by Pastor Barclay. The foolish virgins were used to being counseled and prophesied to rather than having their own relationship with the bridegroom. Because it's your relationship with the bridegroom that causes you to have extra oil. That is powerful right there, folks. 
They always want somebody else's faith to work for them. Aren't you glad when you're a baby Christian, you can rely on that? But God don't want you to stay there. I'm talking about people who don't want to grow up. They don't want to do what's, well, I don't have to go through all that time in the Word and study and prayer and all that. You're a foolish virgin. You're a foolish virgin if that would be you. Says so not me. 10. The wise virgins were interested in Jesus' concerns to have a bride. The foolish virgins were interested in what? Themselves. No matter the cost to others or the cost to what? Christ. 11. The foolish virgins did what? They ran then for oil, but the Lord came while they were getting it. They, verse uh, number 12, they knew all along where to go and get it, but they were what? Too slack to do it. They had just enough oil to make it from day to day. 13, some believers today only read their Bibles, pray, worship, and go to church just enough to get by. This will not make it in the end. Why? Because this perilous times is going to make a demand on you spiritually to draw more out of you, and you better be prepared for it. 14, the foolish virgins were not allowed in heaven. Notice 15, 5 from 10 is what? Let's go through some of these. B, the 50% factor. Number one, 10 virgins, 5 went, 5 stayed, 5 from 10 is... I know it's redundant, but it's just important to understand what we've been reading. Two, two men working in the field, Jesus at one point said. One went, one stayed, one from two is? Two women working in the mill, one stayed, one went, one from two is? Two in a bed, one went, one stayed, one from two is? Yeah, two hung on a cross. Two hung on a cross and Jesus that, uh, two hung on a cross with Jesus that day. One on his right, one on the left. Which one you think went? One on the right, representative of everything he's taught us. One went to paradise with Jesus that day. One was left. One from two is all through the Bible. All through the Bible. Last verses, John 15. Come on, just two verses here. John 15. A believer who walks with God does not intentionally, say intentionally. Come on, does not intentionally get lazy does not intentionally you know, dishonor the word of God, deny God's word in their life, and chooses to be lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. A believer who does not do that has no concern about the return of Jesus. They're ready. Amen. They're not perfect. Tell your neighbor, you're not perfect. Tell them, neither am I. Nope. But if you're walking with Jesus, we are perfect spiritually. But the point I'm making is if we're walking with Jesus, we're ready. I said... If we're walking with Jesus, we're ready. John 15. John 15, verse 1. Jesus said, I'm the true vine. And my father is what? He's the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not do what? Notice that. The branch is in me. It's connected. How do you do that? Salvation. Salvation. The branch is connected. But every branch in me that does not bear fruit. He does what? He's going to take away. And every branch that bears fruit, he's going to do what? Prune. That it may do what? Bear more fruit. Both are connected to Jesus. One allows pruning. One does not. Let me help you. Guess who the non-pruning Christians are? You can't correct them. They won't receive correction. They get offended. They won't receive it through the word. They won't receive it through their leadership. What is this word? God. What is God trying to do? Prune your life to make you more fruitful, make you more powerful, make you stronger. And when you totally reject correction from God, you're totally rejecting his pruning work in your life. You do that, you bear no fruit. And the day comes that the Lord returns, you'll get pulled out. You won't be ready. Number seven, Jesus warned us about those who once brought forth fruit, but no more. Say, I am going to be ready when Jesus comes. How long does it take you to get ready? You can do it right now. It ain't about doing all these things perfect for God. It's about making a decision to say, I'm walking with him tonight. I'm going to walk with him tomorrow. I'm going to walk with him the next day. I'm going to go to his house every chance I get. I'm going to love on him. Not because I have to, because he's there and I want to go visit him. I want to visit him every day in the word. I, I love spending time with God. I love fellowshipping with God. I love looking for opportunity to be used by God to touch other people's lives. I'm not perfect at it. I miss opportunity, but I constantly work at doing my best to fulfill his purpose of helping those who need help. Because if I do it, I'm doing it as unto him. And therefore, I'm a wise virgin. Can I get a better amen? Stand your feet.
We pray that you are blessed by the message Pastor Baker shared with you today. For more spiritual resources that can help you in your walk with God, or to invite Pastor Baker as a guest speaker, just go to our website at cffchurch.com. You will find additional teachings by video, audio, and printed resources that will be a blessing to you. May God's very best be yours.